You know, at first glance, most of us would have a hard time seeing a connection between the line we stand in here at the bank and the way a major entertainment company operates its business. Or how about between the operations of a nationwide freight company and breast cancer research, or even protecting our national interests around the world? Or how about forecasting the outcome of a presidential election and searching for sunken treasure off the coast of South Carolina? Well, the fact is, they're all connected by science, not just any science, but one that combines several familiar disciplines to produce some unique formulas that help us make decisions here in the real world. Its name, operations research, or as it's often called, management science. Hi, I'm Jackson Bain. If you're like me, you haven't given a lot of thought to how management science affects your daily life. But in fact, it does in a big way. Let's take a look around your community. Operations research plays a role in a range of basic services you depend on every day. From police dispatching and the design of the local transit system, the food you buy at the grocery, the books at the bookstore, or the videos you rent, all of these owe something to operations research and the management sciences. If you go anywhere by car or bus, it can help you get there quickly by determining the best routes to travel. And if you've ever flown in an airplane, well, operations research is there in a big way. Just ask Dr. Carla Hoffman at George Mason University. Hi, Jackson. Hello, Carla. One of Dr. Hoffman's areas of expertise happens to be the role operations research plays in aeronautics. That's true. You'd be surprised how critical it is in determining your check-in time at the airport, plus a host of other things, like the type of aircraft you fly in, the crew selected to fly it, when you take off, when you land, which gate you arrive at, and, of course, how quickly you get your luggage. That's important. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. By now, you're probably getting the idea. Operations research or management science, let's call it ORMS for short, has to do with using mathematics, economics, computer science, engineering, and even some psychology to help people make decisions and solve problems. But as little as 75 years ago, if you would have mentioned something called operations research, nobody would have had a clue what you were talking about. In the early 1900s, the American engineer Frederick Taylor used time studies to analyze and evaluate worker performance he was convinced that he could discover the best way to accomplish any given task. About the same time, Henry Gantt went about developing a scientific scheduling system for loading jobs on machines and minimizing production delays. Then in 1915, Ford Harris of the Westinghouse Corporation published a model formula for inventory control. And you know what? That is still in use today. Meanwhile, a mathematician named A.K. Erlang, who worked for the Danish telephone company, began what people might have thought was some pretty esoteric research. In doing so, he founded a branch of applied mathematics that affects us right here in this line. Erlang's contribution was his innovative use of mathematics to analyze the waiting times of callers in automatic instead of manual telephone exchanges. Well, today, his work is associated with what's called queuing theory. And when you look at it, queuing theory is pretty relevant in our lives. Just think about how often you stand in line or are kept waiting for anything on any given day. The reason you wait essentially has to do with the lack of resources. In this case, not enough service people to handle customer demand. As a result, the waiting line. Now, despite what we might think, there are some people who care a great deal about waiting lines. These are people whose business involves serving the public in one way or another, and whose bottom line is absolutely affected by the number of customers choosing to remain in the line, or choosing to leave it. Well, it comes down to balancing the customer's inconvenience with the costs of providing a service. Now, the most important part of successful queuing is to keep people moving. Sometimes it helps to look at what kind of queue people form. 
Some are single stream queues, like the first come, first serve lines we see at a bank or the post office. Others are the multiple stream queues we see at the grocery store, which allow customers to choose their own checkout line. And now the question becomes what kind or how many queues are necessary to provide a satisfactory level of customer service? In fact, one of the nation's most successful companies believes it is vital to its business to get the answer to this question. How long is the average visitor willing to wait in line for a ride? Yes, that's right. Disneyland employees spend a lot of time collecting customer opinions on site and then reviewing data of their experiences. One of the interesting things we've studied and we've found to be pretty, pretty common is that once a line reaches 90 minutes, there's a reject factor. Everyone remembers more or less the cattle pen that started this all where, ooh, we've got all these people waiting in line, so you orderly put them back and forth in a series of ropes, but uh, that becomes very uh, taxing if you do that more than, say, two or three times in a day. So uh, I think the exciting thing here at Disneyland now is we offer a multitude of really interesting environmental experiences. You are in a jungle right here. <laughs> These answers are so important to the organization that it incorporates queuing theory into its overall design plans. Then, they develop computer programs that simulate visitor behavior and waiting times. Well, I think when queues first started, it was just because there were too many people waiting to get in and not enough capacity to handle all the people that demanded to see the show. And as a result of that, the longer the queue lines grew, I think the more I know in our case, we realized that our duty really was to entertain them while they're waiting to get in. So a whole new business spawned from the, the natural growth of queue lines. They just happened, but then around that, we created an industry that makes them a part of the entertainment. And I think that time that you spend, it's roughly 30 minutes where we've got show here for you in the line, is really important to setting the mood and making the adventure that much more exciting for you when you do get to the ride itself. As you could probably imagine, there are a lot of reasons why businesses would want to shorten their customers' waiting time. And it gives us some understanding why operations research and management science would be considered a decision science. But queuing theory isn't all there is to ORMS. And while you might think that it's primarily concerned with decisions that have financial consequences like revenues and costs, profits, that isn't the whole story. Some think ORMS's most important contribution had little to do with dollars and cents. They claim it had a definite effect on world affairs. In fact, helping decide the outcome of the Second World War. It began in the late 30s when the British military set up a team of specialists from various scientific fields to investigate the most effective use of radar. This was, in fact, the beginning of operations research. Well, the success of the British project was so dramatic that during the war, the military assembled more teams to study problems having to do with anti-submarine warfare, civilian defense, and deploying war vessels to accompany supply ships. Two examples of this team approach are credited with helping win the Battle of Britain and ultimately the Battle of the North Atlantic, thus helping turn the tide of the entire war. And the rest, as they say, is history.